Hi everyone, welcome to my channel or welcome back to my channel. My name's Anna and my channel we talk about murder mystery, true crime, cold cases, all that jazz and sometimes we do makeup and sometimes we just sit here and we talk. Today I'm going to be doing makeup. I've been doing a lot of like just doing makeup recently because it's been very therapeutic. I feel like we all kind of need some little therapy sessions right now. I've been thinking about starting a like video list called Therapy Sesh and just doing my makeup and just like talking to y'all. Let me know how y'all would feel about that because like I know I need it and I know it would help definitely in times like this. So yeah, just let me know how you guys feel. But I just want to say thank you for all the views and the subscribers and just everything. I really appreciate you guys supporting me. And it's just, it's been really fun making these videos. I enjoy doing the research. It, I don't know if that's weird. I might have a problem, but like, oh well. Um, but yeah, so it's just, it's a good time over here. We try to have fun anyways with what we're talking about. But yeah, so today is a bit of a doozy it's it's a wild story um it's probably one of the crazier ones that I've covered so far so I want to give my normal little disclaimer that we are going to be talking about a true crime story we will be having adult dialogue description of crime scenes and you know just all that stuff today so yeah well we're gonna get right into today's story I got side Side note for a second. I got my hair done. Don't mind this. I had it up. I'm just, it's crazy. But I got my hair done and like, you know, whenever you just get your hair done and you just feel like a whole new person, mm -hmm. that's how I feel. That's how I feel. But yeah, so put my little caddy is the one. And yeah, we're going to get right into today's story. Today we're going to be talking about um, John George Haig, Haig, Haig. I'm not exactly like 100% sure how to pronounce his last name. I think it's Haig, H-A-I-G-H, yeah. So, mm -hmm. we're going to be talking about him. And he is actually a UK killer. He, I think he's the first one I've talked about from the UK, yeah. And so we're going a little hop and skip away for this one. And he is actually pretty well known over there for his little old crimes. Well, not little old crimes, but... For his craziness. So yeah, we're gonna talk be talking about Mr. John today. John George. That's a mouthful. John George. John George. John George. Anyways. So John, um, he was born July twenty fourth, nineteen oh nine, in Stamford in Lincolnshire. And he it was in the East Midlands of England and that is where he was born. And shortly him and his parents, he was the only child, they actually moved um, and he was brought up in Outward Yorkshire, and it was a little town in Wakefield in England, and, you know, they just, you know, moved there and started their life together. His mom and dad actually didn't think that they could have children because she struggled. His mom's name, sorry, I forgot to tell you guys. His mom's name was Emily, and his dad's name was also John. So I'll probably be doing John Jr. and John Sr. as we're talking about his family. So yeah. So John um, Jr., he was brought up in a very, a very, very religious household. When I say religious, I don't mean... You know, going to church every Sunday and strictly by the Bible, you know, all that stuff. I mean, they were kind of what's called like radical Christians. And they were part of the Plymouth Brethren Church. They were uh, Protestant Christians. And from things that I've read about Protestant Christians, they were pretty hardcore. And his parents were more of the like their beliefs were a, not just a little intense but they were very very intense and he just he was raised in an environment of terror and to be afraid of anything and everything that didn't have to do with his religion so he was brought up to believe that other children were touched by the devil 
and that they had sin and that literally everything was a sin. To read any book but the Bible was a sin. To play, like I said, play with other children was a sin. His mom used to, you know, of course he had to go to school and stuff and read other books. So it terrified him that he was going to be, you know, like punished from God. And he was taught to fear God and not fully, like, he was more taught to fear him instead of um, just having faith and just loving him. And I'm not bashing that religion at all. I just want to make that clear. It's just how they believed it. And I'm just going off of, you know, information that was provided. So anyways, back to the story. He, like I said, was raised to believe those, you know, hardcore beliefs. And like I said, in school, he was terrified that he was going to get you know, struck down from God, basically, for reading another book, and he was just so scared of everything, and his mom used to tell him to run home from school as fast as he could, so he didn't have to spend another minute in a place that was, you know, covered in devil, and that nobody, you know, he basically wasn't as safe around anyone but them. And he had to hurry up and get home back to a Christian household. So his dad had this like really wicked like blue scar on his forehead that he had gotten whenever he was younger. And poor little old John Jr., his whole life, his dad, John Sr., told him that he had gotten that scar from committing sin that... God came down and struck him and gave it to him himself. So, you know, that was all he needed. Like, he had physical proof, like, okay, this actually happens. So, I can't, you know, I can't do anything at all. So, he was a good choir boy. And he was really involved in the church. And so was his family. And I don't mean, like, like I said, every Sunday or Wednesday, like it is here in the South. I mean, every day. Every single day of the week. It didn't matter what day it was, what they were doing. Church was always first, and God was always first. And that is completely fine. But I believe whenever, you know, you go ham into it like that, it's a little it's a little crazy. But like I said, not bashing them at all. They believed what they believed, and that's completely fine. So... Like I said, you know, he was a very good, like, choir boy, and he had this reoccurring dream all the time, because, like I said, he was terrified of his own religion, and I think that's just, oh, hitting my mirror and stuff. I think that was just, like, really sad, because you don't need to be terrified of something like that, and the reason I say he was so terrified is because he had this reoccurring dream that he would be walking through the woods and there would be all these trees and then all of a sudden out of nowhere the trees would turn into crucifixes and then he would start running and running and then rain would start to fall on him but whenever he looked down at you know his hands and his body and the ground to see the rain it was blood and in this dream a man would start to walk around to the trees because they would go back to being just trees. He would almost like snap out of it, like all being blood and crucifixes. And this man would walk around to these trees with an empty cup in his hand and he would collect the blood from all of the trees and he would walk up to John Jr. and he would force him to drink the blood that was in the cup and that was a form of to him that was a form of you know drinking the blood of Christ and it was just it just really showed like how scared he was to do any wrong or to you know anything at all and I just think that's in my personal opinion I just think that's really sad like it's like mm, all right just sad so like I said, he just kept being a good kid and doing what he was supposed to do. And his dad had put up a lot of fences, like, around the house to keep people out. 
that didn't believe the things that they believed. So, you know, they just cut off every single person that didn't believe, you know, what they did. And it just, it didn't do good at all. And like I said, their beliefs were just so intense and they just got pushed onto him and pushed onto him and it didn't do any good for little John Jr. at all. And so around 10 or 11 years old, he kind of started to, John Jr. kind of started to wean out of his parents, you know, beliefs a little bit. And he started kind of like experimenting to see, I guess, what he could get away with. Like, he started with, you know, like little sins, as what they said they were. And as, you know, reading another book instead of the Bible. And when God didn't come and give him the blue strike on his forehead, you know, he was like, all right, well, that's weird, but okay. So he started to do other little small things like tell a lie here and tell a lie there and just to see, kind of to push the limits of what he could do and to get away with without getting penalized by God and getting this blue strike on his forehead. So then he kind of started to get a little upset and a little angry as one would because there were two things that he was upset about. He was upset because he thought that God didn't care about him or love him and didn't care about his sins or that the religion was completely fake and his parents had been lying to him and that God wasn't real at all because he wasn't punishing him for committing these so-called sins. So, he was very, 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 very upset. But he did not confront his parents. Instead, he kind of became a good boy on the outside, bad boy on the inside type. So, he would go to church and he would dress in suits and he would work and he would just do really good things and be good for his family and stuff but then he would lie or he would commit these so-called sins that weren't allowed to be committed so like I said it just he really really kind of became like all right well this is fake and so he just he got so upset I believe that he just didn't know what to do with himself so at the time John left school at 17 years old, and he worked for a time as an apprentice to a, um, a, for a motor engineer, like a mechanist or whatever. And the thing about John is he did not want to actually work. He wanted to finesse the system, basically. So, John figured out that I'm so sorry that I'm, like, having a drink so much. I don't know what's wrong with my voice. But anyways, so, like I said, John did not really want to work. He just wanted to live the lavish lifestyle. And he was trying to figure out, like I said, how to finesse the system, basically. And if you don't know what finessing means, it means, like, work, work in the system. Like, how can he cheat it? So, he got this job as a, a mechanic, but, you know when you go to get something fixed at like a, a shop or whatever and it doesn't get fixed it's kind of like no honey you can't fake that like that's that's somebody's car they're gonna know that's just how it is like stupid anyways so he like I said he got figured out basically and he was like alright well I can't do this no more so he kind of was like alright well what am I going to do and he didn't know like just yet what he was going to do so he started to think about things because he didn't want to work for anyone else he wanted to be able to make his own money and be in charge of himself excuse you Jackie Jacqueline so he kind of wanted to be like in charge of himself and be able to make his own decisions and make his own money, you know, as one would. I mean, it sounds good, right? Like, who wouldn't want to do that? Well, 
It wouldn't be a good idea if we weren't making a story about it, would it, Jackie? You can't. Oh my She's going to start making biscuits, y'all. Like, she is. Oh, my goodness, that is blinding. Anyways, back to the story. So, he got the idea to be a salesman. And he was so good at being a salesman. Like, he was very smart. He was very charismatic. He was very charming. He was a ladies' man. He could talk to people. And a lot of his coworkers and stuff, his job wanted to be like him and looked up to him. And the company loved him, like, so, so much. They just, they really, really liked him. And he was just a big hit. So... Like I said, he was very comfortable with his job. A little too comfortable because at the time, that job kept kind of like a tin can of money around. It was an old time, older times, not an old time, but it was older times. So, they kind of didn't have the things, you know, like the safety measures that we have like today. So, you know, things were kind of just left out to do their own thing. Well... He started to get the idea of like, well, I need some more money and this isn't doing it. So, I've got to figure out a way to basically get more money without doing anything. And so, of course, as you could probably guess, this tin can, he started to take little bits of money out of it, little by little. And nobody would notice. And so, then he got confident and then he was like, alright, well... I could just take a little bit more. And then people actually started to notice that the money was going missing. And they found out that it was, in fact, John. And it was just, ugh, it was so bad. He was fired. And there he was, jobless. And, you know, he just had been fired from something that he was really good at. And it was kind of like, I don't know why they didn't press charges on him. I would have, but whatevs. So, but anyways, they just fired him, and he didn't really know what to do at, you know, back at the time. So, he moved back in with his parents, and he followed back in their ways, and, you know, he just, he had to do what he had to do, basically. So, he was very, very well-groomed, and like I said, he wore a lot of suits. He took very good care of himself. Like I said, he was very smart. He was very handsome. The ladies loved him. And so, he, like I said, he wanted his lavish... I keep saying, like I said, I'm so sorry. He wanted that lavish lifestyle, but he didn't want to really have to work for it. He was like, oh, I want all this money, but I don't want to do anything. Like, nah, I wish. But anyways, so he met this wealthy, wealthy lady, Beatrice Hammer. And Hammer? Hammer. And... She was very wealthy, and so was her family. And after four months of dating, he actually proposed to her, and they got married. And they got their own apartment, and he dropped all of his religious beliefs. Like, completely dropped all of it. Was not, he was not with it anymore. So, with that being said, he kind of had this new freedom. He had this money. He had this wife. He had his own place. He wasn't under his parents' control anymore. He could basically do whatever in the world he wanted to do. And they also, him and Beatrice wanted to start a family. And things were good for a while, but then they weren't. They kind of started to not really get along. And money was kind of becoming short. And they couldn't really, they were comfortable but they wouldn't have been able to afford their lavish lifestyle and have a child. And so, you know, things started to get a little different. And he was trying to figure out, like, you know, how are we going to make money? How are we going to do this? So, John actually saw that a man in the paper had scammed a car dealership and had been arrested. And instead, as one would probably read that and be like, Oh, man, you know, like, that's stupid. I wouldn't do that. No, no, no. Mm -mm, not John. He was like, huh, all right. Because he thought he was smart and better than everyone else and just the man, he thought, you know, well, I'll get away with it. I'll be smarter than this dude. Like, whatevs. So, 
he immediately gets the idea to start doing the same thing that this guy was just arrested for. And so, what he would do is he would go to the car dealership and he would finance a vehicle under somebody else's name. So, say he would go to somebody that was like in the phone book or make up a name or whatever. John Jacob Dingleheimer Schmidt, whatever. So, say John Jacob went to the dealership to get a car. He got a car financed. The dealership and him worked out a pay Shall to give it a two. Worked out a payment plan and, you know, he was like, all right, worked out a little payment plan. They're gonna do what, you know, car, car dealerships normally do. <laughs> Sorry, that was like not very descriptive. But they were gonna, he basically make payments on the vehicle like you would nowadays. And so, he finances it. He he gets it for like a hundred bucks, and then he goes home. The first payment rolls in. They don't get the dealership doesn't get it. The second one rolls in. They still don't get it. And when they go to look up, you know John Jacob, he is not a person. So basically, John has gotten away with stealing a vehicle, basically. And what he would do is he would go and find somebody that would want the vehicle and he would sell it at a much higher price. And that worked for him. He actually did that for a while. And he made, I mean, thousands of dollars from doing this. He was very, very good at it, I guess you could say. Which is stupid. But he was very good at it. So... Of course, it didn't take long, but eventually the police caught up to him and he was arrested and sent to jail. And at the time, Beatrice was actually pregnant and she had a little baby girl and she was not able to afford to take care of the child without John being there and not working and not having the money for it. So she gave up her child for adoption and while John was in prison, Beatrice filed for divorce and left him, sold the house, moved away, and just said, screw this man. Because she had no idea what he was doing, like, at all is what she said. And she just couldn't believe it, basically, that this had happened. And I'm sure she was so hurt because of her child and just, just everything. So, at the time, John's family had, like, disowned him, basically. And, because, you know, he had gone to jail, he was a bad person in their eyes, and, you know, disowned the Lord, and their beliefs, and their religion, so, they basically saw him as a problem, and they disowned him, and didn't want anything to do with him at all. So, little John, sitting up in jail, doing his thing, serving his time, and then he gets out at 25 years old. And he was homeless, single, and broke. And his family was very forgiving. And like I said, they were crazy in their beliefs and very radical. But in their own way, they loved their child. So, of course, if John was willing to accept their religion back into his life, they were willing to accept him. Or, yeah, they were willing to accept him back into their life. And that's exactly what happened. He moved back in with his parents. And John was trying to think of, you know, basically like a future for himself. Like, what is he going to do? Where is his path going? You know, just what is it? Because he was, like I said, he was kind of lost. So, at the time, his parents wanted to help him. It's a little trick. I'm going to just say a side note. If you have really crazy fallout and you can get it in time without getting it into your skin... Take some translucent, I got it everywhere. Take some translucent powder and a fluffy brush and just very lightly swipe the sparkles away and see, they're gone. I mean, they're right there because I want them to be, but yeah, they're gone. So anyways, a little trick for you guys. 
So anyways, like I said, he moved back in with his parents and they wanted him to be successful and to do the things that he wanted to do. So they gave him a little loan to start a business with one of his partners and it was a cleaning business. And it was very, very successful. John was happy. His life was going good. Until, very tragically, his partner was hit by a car and was actually killed. And the business just, ugh, it just, it completely tanked. And he, he didn't know what to do with himself. And he was just really, really upset because he had finally gotten to a good space mentally and everything and he was doing like living out here living his best life and then all of a sudden this tragic thing happens and he kind of just goes into this like little state of well you know nothing good is supposed to happen to me nothing good is supposed to happen to me i don't deserve good things which is very sad because that's not true whenever something like that happens to you it's not the case whatsoever it's hard but sometimes you just got to keep getting on um but he was just very depressed about what happened because, like I said, he thought he wasn't supposed to be happy. So, it really just had a really, really, really negative effect on him. And it was really sad, in my opinion. I mean, he didn't have to turn into a piece of crap, but he did. But anyways, so, like I said, this devastated him. And he didn't know, he was, like I said, he was lost again. He had no idea what he was doing, where he was going to go, just nothing. Like, he was just completely completely lost so in 1936 he moved to east london and got a job as a chauffeur and he worked for the mcswan family and they were extremely wealthy they owned a lot of properties and he they had a son his name was william and william mcswan and him and john actually became really really good friends like they vibed real hard and they became very very close so, of course, at that time, John was like, you know, I'm scamming these mofos and I'm dipping. Like, that was that was his plan was to get his money, get that bread, get that head, and leave. That was his plan. So, instead of doing that, though, he became really close to William. And he ended up liking William, the son of the McSwans. He began to like him a lot. And they became very, very close friends. And he didn't want to scam him or use him for profit and he actually thought that it would be smarter for him to keep the McSwans as friends instead of employers so he quit that job and he started his own little um business and well he did a lot of very 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 sketchy things like I said, the McSwan family, they became very close friends with John and they let them or let him work on like pinball machines that they had because he was an engineer and a mechanic. And they just really, really trusted him to be in their circle and be in their life, you know, as one would whenever somebody becomes a friend and vibes with them. Like, but, anyways. So, like I said, they became really close, and they were all hanging out, and John and William, they would go to bars together. They just did a lot of, like, activities together. <clears throat> so, let me tell you what little old John would do to gain some money for himself. So, I'm going to be looking away from the camera because I'm going to be doing my... Or not, like, I'm not going to be looking at you while I'm talking. I'm going to be looking like this. Because I'm going to be doing eyeliner and i got to, like, get up in here. So, yeah. So, Mr. John used a, he became a solicitor. And what a solicitor does is they're kind of like a lawyer, like, sort of. And they handle small things like divorces or property things. You know, like, just really small stuff. And so he became a solicitor, which he was not licensed to do at all. So illegal. And he would use the name of this really big company. And he would pretend that he was a branch off of them, which 
we all know was a lie and that was not true whatsoever so like I said he would get people to come in he would get them to give him their money and how he would do that is he would say that he had stocks and shares of people that had passed away or you know just something and they would give him their stocks and shares and that he would be able to sell them at a lower price to other people that wanted to buy them. So, of course, people were like, oh, yeah, that's an amazing deal. Let's do it. So, a lot of people actually, you know, used him and gave him their money, which is really, really sad. But John had no stocks and shares. He had no passed away people that he had connections with or anything with at all. So, he would get these people to give him their money and then he would basically shut down the whole soliciting business before people would realize what he'd done and he would move to a, another town and he would do the same exact thing. He did this in three other places. The first one was in East London. The second one was in Guildford and Curry. And then the second, or the other one, the blah, 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 sorry, the last one, the third one was in East Sussex. He would do the same thing. He would go open a soliciting business, pose as a solicitor, and seem to have stocks and shares from deceased clients. And then he would use the people's money and he would get away with it every single time. And so he actually made a lot of money for what he was doing. I mean, a lot of it. And at the time, hold on. Ah, okay, sorry. <laughs> so at the time, like I said, you know, it's like the 30s and the 40s. Money is, it's it's a lot. Like, you know, it's obviously higher value, just everything. So, he actually made roughly, it was anywhere between, between and over 200,000 pounds. That's a lot. That's I mean, that's like a lot, a lot, a lot. Like a lot, a lot, a lot. Like, I'm just, whoa. It's insane to me. So... He just, he did the thing, I guess, and he made a lot, a lot of money for it. But what he didn't realize is that it was going to be very easy for the police to track him because he would put these ads in the paper for the stocks and the shares and posing as a solicitor and a salesman. And obviously police could tell the people that it was, you know, John Hagen who did it. And the police would be able to track him. So, that wasn't a very good plan for him, I guess. It worked out in the beginning, but then he ended up getting caught. So, he would be... Oh, goodness, sorry. He would be sentenced for four years at 28 years old. And in prison, he did not stop scamming or anything at all. I guess he, you know, obviously didn't learn his lesson. And he would brag to the other inmates about his crimes and things that he had done and things that he had actually planned on doing whenever he got out of prison. So, from my belief, I don't feel like he ever had any intention on doing things the right way or trying to get his life on track. I guess because he probably felt like every time he tried to, something happened, but, you know, whatever. So, he... Like I said, would brag to the other inmates. And he also, you know, got some of them to help him with storming the uh, mail room in the prison. They would bust up in there and they would steal... <coughs> Sorry. They would steal other inmates' um, money. Not money. <laughs> mail. And they would hold it ransom, basically, until... The other inmates gave them money or traded something with them that he wanted. So, he started basically his own little scamming business inside of prison. It didn't last long. He was obviously caught and he was apprehended or, you know, in trouble for that. So, actually, you know, around that time it was World War II 
and money was tight and they were trying to figure out a way to basically save money and their solution was to let out prisoners that had smaller sentences or smaller crimes so people that have like you know maybe had drugs or maybe you know traffic stuff or I don't know whatever so at the time they he was actually released a year early from prison and I just was like oh, it's crazy but it did not take long at all for him to be right back in jail because not even a year later he was taken back and I'm just like dude come on I mean I keep looking at this monitor thing sorry <laughs> but a year later he was taken back right on to jail and him and the other inmates you know like I said they got clothes buddy buddy and he just kept doing the same old shady stuff that he was always up to doing by the way not trying to shade nobody right now but uh I'm using it because it's all I got at the moment but I was looking for a really good lip plumper I was like cheap look good and I went and got this stuff from Walmart that's hard candy plumping serum mm -mm, don't get it it, it ain't good shawty it ain't good but anyways so <sighs> in prison instead of being like all right I'm gonna change my life I'm gonna get better I'm gonna do better for me and for my fam and you know just everyone around me and no 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 instead he was like all right well this is my time to shine and he started to think basically well like why why am I getting caught why am I you know why can I not get away with the crimes that I'm trying to commit and so he started to actually do research in the prison library and the prison library at the time actually had a bunch of research on like serial killers and stuff like that which I don't think is smart to have history on serial killers when you got a bunch of serial killers in your prison but who am I you know what is so he just he did a lot of research and he actually got inspiration from this very famous French killer and his name was George Alexander Surrey and he was known for killing his um were known for killing like three people and he dropped their bodies in um uh sorry i'm about to disturb y'all a little bit but um he dropped their bodies into vats of acid yes and dissolved them yes and um yeah so old dude was like uh awesome and instead of being freaked out or concerned or turned off or anything at all, he was like, bet, this is the one. This is, this is the dude I've been looking for my whole entire life. So he started to do a lot of research on laws in the UK. And one of the things that he thought, and he completely misread and was totally wrong about it, was that if the police didn't have a body at all, no matter how much they thought you did it, they could not arrest you and that is like not the case whatsoever so yeah well he thought that he was armed with all this new information and he was ready like he was so ready to get out of you know prison and instead of stopping his research and just quitting the curiosity he decided that he wanted to attempt to try this whole acid, dissolving in acid thing. So he started, basically started doing experiments inside the prison. And what he would do, ooh, these lashes. And what he would do is he would bribe the inmates that worked outside to bring him rats. And he was one of the, like, um, John was one of the trusted inmates there. So, he got to have a really nice job, and it was working in the metal shop there. So, in the metal shop, they had very, very small amounts of sulfuric acid. Sorry, I just, like, struggled with that word for a second. Sulfuric acid. I mean, very, very small amounts, because it's obviously a prison. But he started, basically, to collect that. And small amounts at a time, until he got three flasks, basically, like, little jars or whatever, full of acid and then he would take these mice and 
sit break. <clears throat> he would take these mice and he would put them into the acid to basically time and test how long it takes for them to dissolve. And he timed that it would take 30 minutes for them to dissolve. So he was just very, very interested, I guess, in that and wanted to test his thing before he went out into the real world and actually started to use it. So, in 1943, he was released at the age of 34, and his master plan to get rich, you know, had to start somewhere. He knew that it was going to be a struggle because getting rich was hard, and he obviously did not want to work. He didn't want to make an honest living. He wanted to scam people. He wanted to do things the not legal way. So, he had to target people that were rich and had a lot of money and that he could get away with killing, basically. Because he figured out that the reason he wasn't getting away with things is because he left everybody alive. So, that was why his crimes were getting figured out. Not because, you know, he was a terrible person and deserved it, but because he left witnesses. <clears throat> so, he had to go back home to his parents again. And he was there for a while, got up some money, started working and everything. And then he got an apartment back in East London and became another salesman. And he was very, very good at being a salesman. He just, it was something that he was so good at for some reason. Like I said, he was just very charismatic. Sorry, that was my notes. <laughs> he was very charismatic and he just, you know, could talk to people. And he was very, very good with that. So, the summer of 1944... He ran into his old friend, Mr. William, that, um, Mr. M blah, 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 blah. Mr. William McSwine that he worked for and was a show for, for their family, and he met him at a bar again, and they basically rekindled their friendship, and they started to hang out again, go to bars, you know, all that jazz. Whenever I do this, in case you were wondering, I have moles that I like a lot on my face because they add features. And I like to re-highlight them whenever I put makeup on because they low-key disappear. So, that's what I'm doing when I do this. But back to the story. So, him and William met up and they started drinking and having fun. And he just, you know... They were just back to basically being friends again, and he loved it, and he missed him, and he forgot, like, basically how good their friendship was, but this time he had no intention of keeping him around. He just had one thing, one mindset, and one mindset only, and that was to get rich and get that coin, baby. That's all he wanted to do. So, it was, ugh, just anyways. So, September 9th, 1944, um, the two went for a drink at the bar, and they hung out for a little while, and he actually ended up inviting, um, William back to his basement that he had, and it was kind of like an abandoned basement that he had turned into as, like, his little workshop. He had makeshift his own, um, little uniform to wear to not get the acid on him. He had gotten 40-gallon drums, acid, like, just all types of things, a little bench and everything, a little workshop bench. He had all of that he had innovated and built for himself to commit these crimes. So, he took William back to the basement, and when William wasn't paying attention, he hit him over the head with a lead pipe, and then proceeded to attack William until he was no longer alive, and... He left his body, like, just sitting on the table for a little bit. And even though William was gone, uh, John proceeded... I'm just trying to figure out how to word this. John proceeded to slice his neck. And he... So, he had been dead for a little while now. So, the blood in his body was completely dry. So, in order for him to do what he did, he had to actually squeeze his flesh... And John took a cup and placed it underneath the wound that he had just put on William. He squeezed and squeezed his neck, basically wrung it out like a rag. 
until he got blood out of it and he drank it and in that moment he had a flashback to the dream that he had whenever he was younger and in that moment he was feeling very like anxious and very but excited almost at the same time he had realized what he had done but it was overwhelming and it was he didn't care like he he liked it he enjoyed it just the way he enjoyed torturing the mice like he just really really enjoyed it making biscuits um so at that time he then took william's body and placed it into a 40 gallon drum of acid and he just kept pouring it in there and the fumes of it were so strong and he was getting woozy and woozy and he was like all right i'm almost done just a little bit more and then he wakes up and he is not on not standing on his feet anymore he's on the ground he didn't have any acid on him. He had actually just sat it down, but he woke up, and I'm sure he was like, uh, what the, what the what just happened? So, he then goes outside, gets some fresh air, and then comes back inside and proceeds to finish pouring the acid into the 40-gallon drum. He seals it, and then he spends all night just up all night. I mean, all night long, just hoping and praying basically that the acid was working in the 40 gallon drum the next morning he opens it up and there is the black sludge that was in the same container that the mice were in and just to be on the safe side he actually left the uh, 40 gallon drum there for a couple of days just to make sure that there were no pieces that weren't dissolved so then he took the 40 gallon drum a few days later and he dumped it into a manhole that was actually just in a random street so that was very uh ballsy of him to do and the night that he killed william he actually went to the pub that they always go to and partied and had a few drinks and had a good time like nothing happened and that's when he came back and did the whole next slice of thing. So, after he killed John, he went... Or, sorry, after he killed John. After he killed William, John went to the McSwan's house. And he was very, very close with their parents already. Because, like I said, you know, they, he was their chauffeur and their family friend. So, they knew him and they felt comfortable with him. And at the time, World War II was going on. And William was terrified of being drafted. And his family knew that. Everyone around him knew that he was just terrified of going to the war. So, he told, John told his family, his two parents, that he actually went to Scotland to flee World War II and being drafted. And that he would be back in a couple of years or whenever the war was over. So... Of course, they were upset, but they knew that, you know, his, their son was very scared of being drafted, and, you know, that was a logical thing for him to do, and that was something that a lot of people were doing, especially if you had money, and they had a lot of that. So, John basically weaseled his way into the McSwan's family and kind of took over the role of son, basically, and they treated him as their own. And he took over the role that William had, which was going around to the tenants and collecting their money. Because, like I said, they owned a lot of properties and a lot of apartment complexes and condos and things like that. So, William went around and collected the money. And John actually got that job. And, of course, he started stealing and scamming. And the McSwans became suspicious of him. And so, he was like, oh, no, no, no. Y'all got to go. And... That's exactly what he did to them. He brought them to the same exact basement. He lured them there one by one. And he did the same exact thing that he did to William. He did not slit their throats. He actually just put their bodies into the 40-gallon drums. And this time, he had actually bought a face mask. And it wasn't suspicious for people to buy a face mask at the time because, you know, like I said, World War II was going on. So, it just, it wasn't like, it wasn't a fishy thing for people to be doing. So, it wasn't seen as weird. So, he got all of their properties basically signed over to him and a lot of their belongings. And he was just able to just pose as somebody else, pose as William, and to get the money from his family or from William's family and so he sold everything and he got about 10,000 pounds and that did not last him long at all though because he had a very hardcore gambling problem none of his money lasted like he he gambled it away and he drank and it was just it wasn't good so he needed a new target 
for his next scam because he was running out of money. So Dr. Archibald Henderson was age 52 and his wife, Rosaline Henderson, she was age 41. They were very wealthy and they owned a lot of rental properties. And of course, John posed as somebody with a lot of money who was interested in a rental property. And so they made a deal with them and the Hendersons were actually going on a vacation or a little holiday as you call it over there and so they were staying at another place in Bridgeton for a few days in the Metro Metropole Metropole yeah Metropole Hotel and John actually followed them to Bridgeton and conveniently had just bought a new warehouse there with some of his money that he had made and he had kept I guess and he bought a new, bigger, and better warehouse for him to commit his crimes in. He had bought um, a metal bath and all this acid. He bought a pump for the acid so it wouldn't spill on him, so he could pump it directly into the bath. He was just becoming very, very crafty with his little creation. So, same thing with them. He lured them to the warehouse and promises of properties and deals and just different things. And he attacked both of the people and both of the people. I'm so sorry. He attacked Archie or Archibald. I wanted to call him Archie because you know Riverdale. But he attacked Archibald Henderson and Rose Henderson at the same time. And he put their bodies in to the bathtubs of acid. And then disposed of them the same way that he had disposed of the other ones into a manhole into the ground. So, it was said that the warehouse, I read different things, is that he dumped it into manholes in the road. And then he dumped it into a manhole that was actually, like, already in the warehouse. So, either one of those. But, at the time, he wanted, basically, you know, to have... Just have his way and just get away with things and just be a terrible human being, basically. And so, he thought of other ways to scam. And then, he met Olive Durand Deacon. And she was a very wealthy widow who lived in Onslow Court Hotel. Same place as John at the time. He had actually moved there. And Olive, she was so creative. She was just very artsy. She loved to create things. And she had came up with this new invention, because that was her thing, was inventing stuff, of artificial fingernails. So, acrylics and things like that. And at the time, Mr. John was posing to be an engineer to all of these people. That was his thing. He posed as an engineer. So that was the way he was able to get all these people's trust because he posed as a rich, wealthy man. He dressed well. Like I said, he was charismatic. He just, he was very good at what he did. And he was a salesman, so he could pitch whatever. So Olive went to him because he was an engineer and she wanted his advice. So of course, John being the scummy little scum scum that he is of the earth, he went and thought, like, okay, bet this is a good idea. I'll kill Shoddy now. And he, of course, lured Olive to the warehouse with promises of deals and helping her invent her little invention that she was coming up with of the artificial fingernails. And he attacked her the same way, basically, bludgeoned her and put her body into a... A bathtub of acid the same way he had done the other ones and at this time he had bought another warehouse and I guess he just kept he kept moving locations so he wouldn't be found out I'm pretty sure and he was just trying to buy up all these different things and he had had the whole setup again with the bath and everything and so he actually did not have a manhole or a manhole in the warehouse or in the road that he could dispose of her body after it was dissolved. So he actually um, dumped her body in a pile of rubble behind the warehouse and it was probably the stupidest thing that he could have done because he was caught, I mean like almost instantly from doing that and it's just like bro like all of it's dumb, but that was very, very dumb. 
Hold on one second, guys. I'm like, I lost something here. There we go. Okay, we're good. Anyways, so, <laughs> sorry about that. But he, he just, he was so dumb. And it was not very hard for police to discover the body. Because, like I said, he didn't leave the body in the vat of acid like he did with all the other ones to make sure that it was completely dissolved. He actually left some of the body parts in there. And it was very noticeable. And it was called in. And... He was number one because he was the last seen with her, the last to know her. Just, you know, it was obvious. And they arrested him for murder and they charged him with it. And the media was the one in UK who actually named him the um, acid bath killer. And they, UK went insane with this man. I mean, they went ballistic. He has movies, books, documentaries, everything about him. Like, I guess it was just like a big thing. For them at the time, like, it was probably one of the craziest things that had happened to them. I mean, it was the early, like, you know, early times. So, it was kind of unknown, I guess, for people to do things like this. in Or, like, in that area or just around them or whatever. But he was trying to plead insanity. And John actually asked one of the arresting officers if he would get lesser time in prison or he would get lesser time in a psych ward than he would in prison. Like, he wanted to know if he would be able to ever get out of the psych ward if he pleaded for insanity. And, of course, the arresting officer told the judge and the jury on the witness stand and everything. And the second the jury heard that, they were like, mm-mm, that ain't it, baby. And they immediately, immediately charged him with all of the murders that he had committed. And he was hanged. And it was just, it was, oh my goodness. So, John George Hagen was hanged for his crimes August 10th, 1949. And he should have been. Straight up. Like, I don't, he should have been. You gave people acid baths. Like, did anybody ask for that? Anybody ask you to do that, bro? Like, you could have stayed home. You could have just not done it. But... <sighs> that's why I do these videos because I I need to understand why people are the way that they are. It's just I've always been interested in the brain and how it works and not just serial killers but psychological stuff too. You know, like therapy, like I said, little therapy sessions and everything. So, yeah. But that was the story about Mr. John Hagen, the acid, I was about to say the acid king, but that was Ricky Casso. Uh, um, the acid bath killer. So, yeah, he was just, he was insane, guys. And, um, I don't know, like, he was just, he was bananas. This eyelash is driving me insane. I don't feel like it's as bougie as the other one. We're the same eyelashes, but whatever. So, yeah, thank you guys for coming and chatting with me today and watching me do my makeup. And I hope you like the look. I find that doing this helps my eyes with the whole thing a little bit more it's just it's how i've done my makeup for a while i love it um i am really thinking about doing the whole therapy session thing i think it would be really good for us to have a safe place to go no matter who you are what you believe like anything it does not matter like you can come and it's a safe place like I uh, am a safe place. <laughs> I want you guys to feel welcome and to just be able to escape from whatever is troubling you for a little bit and just to sit down with me for a, an hour or 30 minutes or 45 or whatever it is and just to have a little break from the world around you. So I appreciate you guys clicking on this video and coming and hanging out with me if you like it. If you like me, if you want to see more, just comment, share, subscribe. And, yeah, just interact with me, guys. I would love to hear more from you and to just know how you personally feel about these cases and these stories that I do. And, um, also, you can comment me stories, DM, Instagram. They're all linked in my channel info. So, yeah, they're all on my channel. But, thank you, guys, like I said, for coming. And just stay safe and remember to be kind and know that I love you. Peace.